Hello, everybody. My name is E. David Crawford, and I'm editor in chief of Grand Rounds in Neurology. There's no question that BPH, benign prostatic hyperplasia, has been called many other things over the years, has uh, been a real challenge uh, for urology. Um, just a few months ago, I had the opportunity to speak with an old friend, colleague, and researcher. Steve and I have been together for decades uh, in this area of BPH, and Steve Kaplan and I talked about the pivotal paper that uh, had just come out in the Journal of Urology, the phase three trial for the new BPH treatment with Optolume BPH catheter sy system. Um, we're going to continue this discussion now. We had a lot of interest in that presentation with a three-part series discussing BPH market. We're going to talk about the options for the treatment and the patient management. Uh, joining me today are uh, two internationally known urologists who have um, done a lot of work in their career in the area of benign prosthetic hyperplasia and many other things. Uh, Dean Elterman, um, who is uh, from Toronto, and Steve Kaplan, uh, who is from New York and uh, also spends some time in lovely Florida. So over the years, uh, you know, as I think about my career in, uh, in urology and uh, BPH, I've, we've seen a lot of things that have been done to the prostate. Uh, it sort of started out when I grew up, we just had TUR and didn't even have any medications. Uh, we've come a long way in both areas, and we've seen things injected into the prostate, freezing, heating, Botox, uh, lifts, steam, and it goes on and on and on. And um, one of the most exciting things that I've seen that's come along in the last decade is this uh, concept of the Optibloom BPH uh, catheter system. So I'm going to turn this over um, to uh, Dean right now and uh, welcome you. And let's uh, go ahead and begin our discussion. Well, that's great. Thanks uh, very much, Dr. Crawford. It's a pleasure to join Grand Rounds in Urology, uh, as always with my co-host and mentor, Steve Kaplan. So today, what we're going to be doing is taking you through the Optulum BPH catheter system. I'm going to take you through an overview of the device in terms of how, how it works. And uh, Steve is going to take us through some of the clinical data uh, that has uh, matured over the last several years. So to start things off, let's talk a little bit about what is the Optulum BPH drug-coated balloon catheter. Well, really, it has three unique characteristics or three components that I'd like to draw your attention to. The first is that it is a dilation balloon, and it's a specially designed balloon. You can see here in this picture, it's actually a double balloon, which is very different than older balloons that you may have imagined or seen, like the Dowd balloon from many years ago. The idea is that this balloon will inflate both in the bladder and in the prostate, and where they meet, it almost locks it in place at the bladder neck. And by inflating the balloon and dilating the prostate, what we're doing is we're creating an anterior commissurotomy, which separates the natural tissue planes between the two lateral lobes of the prostate up at the 12 o'clock position. But we also know that merely dilating the prostate may not be sufficient for long-term durability. And that's really where the secret of the Optulum BPH drug-coated system really takes place. And that is the drug coating. The balloons are covered with paclitaxel, and paclitaxel is rapidly released and it's controlled. Uh, and what it does is it prevents a hyperplastic response and it maintains the patency of that dilation. In other words, the anterior commissurotomy is created, the tissue planes are spread open, and then the paclitaxel is absorbed from the coating into this area to essentially disrupt the inflammatory process and allow the prostate to heal in an open configuration. The third component is how the device is actually positioned. You can see that there is a blue placement marker, which is a band that enables correct positioning along the working length of the balloon intraoperatively. And you position this uh, beyond the vera montanum, just distal to the external sphincter. And we'll have in our series of lectures some tips and tricks about how to perform the procedure. 
Uh, in terms of some takeaways that we're going to discuss, we know that the Opulum BPH drug-coated balloon system is a novel, minimally invasive surgical therapy for BPH. It is in the category of what we are calling MISTs or minimally invasive therapies. Uh, Steve is going to take us through the clinical data, which really demonstrates the highest QMAX improvement in any of the minimally invasive, minimally invasive surgical therapy device trials. And last but not least, the mechanism mechanism of action really is unique in that there is no uh, cutting, burning, lasering, steaming, or permanent implants. The balloon is inflated. It is left in place uh, for the requisite amount of time, approximately 10 minutes, and then removed. You can see from this schematic here a um, drug-coated balloon, which is placed in the prostate. You can see the proximal end of the balloon in the bladder. And what we're really trying to do in this minimally invasive treatment is combine the, me the mechanical dilation of the balloon with the concurrent localized delivery of paclitaxel to improve uh, BPH symptoms. And you can see how the prostate on the right-hand side really opens up. You see an uh, improvement in the diameter, the circumference of the bladder neck, the bladder outlet, really improving um, and reducing the amount of obstruction. And you can see almost a before and after picture where on the before picture, it looks like um, an A, a letter A, where it's very narrow, very tight. And once the dilation has occurred, it changes its configuration entirely more to an, an inverted U shape. And this is what that anterior commissurotomy really is doing. And what's really impressive is at one year, you'll see in that third panel, that large open gap uh, is still evident at the 12 o'clock position. And uniquely, this is really opening up a different part of the prostate compared to other minimally invasive treatments. When you look at the currently invasive, uh, current minimal treatments, you're really opening things up more at nine and uh, three o'clock, whereas the Optilum really focuses at the 12 o'clock position. Thus, it has a very different uh, area of targeting and different mechanism of action. I'm gonna play a brief video here, which again highlights uh, how the device is placed. You're placing it through a rigid scope through the uh, working channel, um, through the external sheath of the um, catheter. It is inflated and you're using that distal blue marker. And as the balloon inflates, you're creating that anterior commissurotomy where the lateral lobes are splitting open to the 12 o'clock position. The paclitaxel is then being released uh, appropriately, especially into that anterior part of tissue that has recently been exposed through the dilation. And then of course, it's going to heal in that patent open configuration afterwards. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Steve Kaplan, who's gonna take us through some of the clinical trial data um, from the early studies to where we are today. Uh, thank you, Dean, uh, and thank you, Dave. Uh, we've been on a long road in treating uh, benign prostate disease and uh, watching the evolution of various types of therapies. And the good news is patients are now having more choices, and I think ultimately that's a very good thing. So uh, I was asked to be the principal investigator for this trial early on, and designed, helped design the Everest and Pinnacle and was involved in the uh, PEAK and APEX trials. The, the idea was to create a phase two trial to determine whether or not this makes any sense. And then finally the registration uh, uh, study of the Pinnacle. So this was the Everest study and this was done uh, in the Dominican Republic and in Panama. And this was a study to just determine uh, this, whether the technology itself actually worked. And this is standard criteria, inclusion and exclusion, nothing specific for, the, uh, for this study. Uh, this was the baseline characteristics with a prostate volume in the mid thirties. We excluded folks who had a intravesical uh, protrusion of more than a centimeter because we wanted to make sure that at least in this series of patients, we were treating patients who could theoretically benefit and this is very typical baseline IPSS and peak flow rate. In the Pinnacle study, uh, this was the uh, baseline for, and this is the sham trial, and essentially very similar, just in terms of having a sham. And interestingly enough, as I'll talk about in a couple of minutes, this was the first trial ever in BPH, ever, that 100% of patients who were treated with sham thought they were treated. So... That was kind of, and again, a tribute to the investigators 
to be able to create an environment where patients thought they were getting uh, treated. And not dissimilar to what we saw, a little bit bigger on the prostates. This was a, 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 US, uh, a US study, and this was the intravesical prostatic protrusion uh, with a, a mean size of about 5.1. Again, similar IPSS and similar uh, flow rates. Uh, we were very proud that this study actually landed on the cover, uh, the pinnacle study in the cover of the Journal of Urology. You don't see BP-8 studies on the cover of the Journal of Urology ever. Uh, and it was kind of nice to see that the reviewers and the editors, and I think the urologic community thought that this was a game change because this is a very different type of results than what we've ever seen with a minimally invasive device. And I'll talk about that just in a couple of seconds. Uh, so with respect to the results of the Everest study and results of the Pinnacle study, we found that the IPSS improved, uh, similar to what we've seen with other minimally invasive studies, but as Dean alluded to, the peak flow rate improvement was turf-like. We've never seen this type of improvement. And it's very interesting at AUA, where I was doing a bunch of presentations on BPA studies, somebody said, well, you know, how come they, they were comparing actually only in lasers to aquablations and said, you know, we've removed so much more tissue. So how come the flow rate improvement is about the same? And I said, well, how come with Optolume where we don't remove any tissue, we're just doing an anterior commissurotomy, we also have the same amount of flow rate improvement. And that suggests that maybe we really need to rethink what we're doing with respect to improving outcomes, because it is amazing that here in a non-tissue removal type of procedure, you're having that type of peak flow improvement. And at AUA and both at EAU, this is now at four years and five years. This is durable data with the lowest retreatment we've ever seen in registry data. So we're pretty, pretty happy that now in two studies, both internationally and national uh, in the US, that this data seems to be holding up of interest. And I think it's a good learning lesson is that usually the data when you do a phase two globally is always better than when it's done in the United States. And here was just the opposite. The data was better in the United States. And it's not because the US investigators were better. It's because we learned during the process of how to do this, how to do it better. And I think that clearly manifested in the results that we, we actually saw. Uh, we didn't see a change in sexual function. That will be the topic of a of an interaction we will have with Kevin McFerry, but a very low surgical retreatment. And that means surgical retreatment. Uh, the, with respect to reimbursement, this is now in negotiation, but at least for now, the projected Medicare payment will be the highest we've ever seen with a minimally invasive device in BPH and the zero day global. So, you know, there, here's the science data that Dean and I presented to you, but economic data, let's be honest with each other, is also going to drive a lot of this engine. And with the zero global it becomes a very attractive option as well. So we hope you get a chance to actually do the procedure. It's now available to be done and get your own experiences. We want to learn from each other uh, to see little tricks uh, of the trade uh, that we'll share. And, and Dean, in another segment, will show his own uh, tips and tricks. But we've been very satisfied so far with the procedure. And we'll see how it impacts not just the minimally invasive device space, which I think it will, but impact how many patients uh, go off medications earlier or go directly to this type of therapy. Thanks for your attention. So I, I want to thank you both for your time. And then we have a couple more uh, of, of these uh, episodes of this trilogy coming up to follow this. Thank you.